Sorry, so Trevor, just get this connected. Yeah, sorry, we got cut off there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's nope, all right. <laughs> no problems, no problems at all. Um, I, I could go ahead and finish that up anyway, that question. Um, do you have anything else to add on that? You were just talking about young players after they get interviewed and what have you, they have to, to deal with that. Um, do you have anything else to add or just want to, want to leave it there? No, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I think we all accept that, um, you know, some players, managers, coaches, anyone in a high profile situation deal with it better than others. What we, we have to try and convey to all the youngsters is that, um, you know, we live in a media world now where the, yeah, the misdemeanors are more likely to be high, highlighted than right. the pluses and, and the positives. So you have to deal with it and you have to recognize that. And, uh, and look, if you, you get caught out once or twice, it's okay. But you mustn't get caught out on a regular basis. So I think your average fan would expect, you know, over a period of time that you get experience at that. And, you know, even if you're supporting a club, you don't want to see, um, you know, players or the club themselves involved in con controversy week in and week out and of course. Uh, so, so you know i just think earning the big money also comes with certain responsibilities as a role model as well so Trevor, one of the things that is unique to english football that really doesn't happen in a lot of other countries is not a lot of english players go abroad most english players stay in the premier league do you feel that's something that prohibits the development of english players the fact that they don't go abroad well i think it's um it's too here is really, I mean, the playing and coaching as well. We don't get a lot of go the other way from a coaching mm. point of view. Um, I don't think it's particularly healthy because I, do, I think, you know, we had one or two players in my generation. I remember Kevin Keegan, uh, you know, did for a while. Liam Brady, Brady did in Italy. Um, uh, Kevin went to Germany. Um, I think you get a little bit lazy if you're a player purely from the point of view. You know, a lot of the time players go overseas. Yes, it's about... You know, getting experience in other cultures and playing the style of football but of course a lot of it's financial and mm. um, the, the English or the British players have been lucky that there's, there's been a very successful top league and whatever so from a financial or wage point of view you haven't got to chase the finances that might be bigger elsewhere because you're going to earn a, you know, a terrific living um, in this country so then that breeds a little bit of laziness sometimes. You know, I, I know coaches, managers come over here, they speak three or four languages. Right. And so all, yeah, and, and all right, because the English language is it, um, you gain, you get lazy, lazy, you don't learn another uh, one or two languages. So uh, it is something uh, on our coaching side, we're trying to sort of widen that um, sort of recognition that perhaps you, you need to do more. Let's go back to our you know, discussion earlier where, the coach in the past used to just be on the pitch, and now there's so many other things. And I think also the you know, the areas have widened it as, as as to where you do your coaching and management. And so the opportunities are there. So perhaps we do le- you know need to learn a bit more about languages, culture, and so forth, and that needs to be incorporated in our coaching programs. But I think um, if more players experience playing abroad, then they might get you know to like the certain kind of want to go back on a coaching point of view. So mm-hmm. I think it, it, the starting end point is um, not a lot of players uh, take the opportunity to go abroad because financially um, they're so well looked after here. There's not the need, um, right. but um, you know you'll get one or two perhaps. Um, you know, particularly let's say I mean, up in America where you you know you've got. Uh, the, there, the the league is you know coming back in in strength, and and what some one or two of the you know, players like Dave Beckham have gone there um, in the latter stages, as long as they're still playing at a high level. I, you know, I think it's beneficial to both. And then, you know, in America, then the, the it's easy probably to adapt more than um, if you went to sort of somewhere in Asia or or, or playing in Japan or something like that. They'd, so again, it depends on the different cultures or the opportunities that are available, but. Um, you know, at present, um, we'd certainly, more than anything, like to get some more English players <laughs> playing in, in our top league rather than even get, thinking about going abroad. Once you That's get them in our top point. league, then I think, you know, you'll you'll get some of our better players perhaps attracted to or, or offered to go to the likes of Spain or Germany, something like that. But at the moment, it's a big enough challenge, so you would have to say... We haven't got enough players to fill our own league, technically, so that's the area that we need to improve on if that's going to be the case. Last couple of questions, Trevor. Chelsea, Manchester United, 2-8. Um, I think most people would prefer that they avoided each other. Um, however, the plus side is the guarantees that English team in the semi-final once again of the Champions League who will play either Inter Milan or Schalke. Most English teams, either it's United or Chelsea, will fancy their chances against either of those. Um, are you happy enough with the standard of the Premier League and how it's gone? 
I mean, I think so. Uh, I mean, last year was a bit of a blip as far as Champions League was concerned. Naturally, um, Spurs, with an early sending off, Peter Crouch got hammered against Real Madrid, so they're yeah. not going to go through. Um, Schalke had an amazing result in, in <laughs> Milan, I must say, 5-2, so they look almost certain to go into the semis. I think most people thought uh, Chelsea or Man United will be playing into Milan in the semis, so who knows? But I, I think it would be a great incentive for Chelsea and Manchester United because um, Schalke surpassed himself with that result and they've obviously got to be dangerous but I think uh, the English side who gets through to the semis will probably be the favourite to get through to the final and naturally you know, the final is at Wembley here in England so there's, there's an even greater incentive a lot of rivalry between the two um, I mean you know going back to the John Terry penalty miss against <laughs> Manchester United yeah, um, that I'm sure that a lot of people in Chelsea would be desperate it's a major trophy for them. It looks like Manchester United are going to win the Premier League. Um, this is the one big trophy they've been looking for. So mm-hmm. I think there's a lot at stake for the West London team. Um, Manchester United just starting to get the better players fit again. Uh, Valencia over the last couple of weeks has come back. has looked really good. Uh, Nani, uh, again, another wide player, is looking good. Uh, Hernandez and Bert the top of, uh, uh, you know, support Rooney. I mean, they've got a lot of goal-scoring potential. So... Okay. Most people just edge Manchester United as the favourites, but that might be counterbalanced with the, the desperation for Chelsea to be successful uh, at Champions League level. Question: United's record is very poor down at Chelsea. Um, last question: Looking at the landscape of English football, there is one thing that possibly may sadden you as a purist, and it's also happened at their own football club, and that's the financial instability. Clubs like West Ham, of course, you had the Icelandic takeover. The club was, has been secured recently with, with, with the takeover of Sullivan. Is there a concern, Trevor, on your part as a lover of the English game about the levels of debt in English football? Yeah, I mean, it's funny enough, a select committee, what we call it, a select committee or a parliamentary group looking into areas such as that at the moment with the, the Premier League, the FA and the Football League. I mean, it's not just the top league, the Premier League, there's big issues in, in the Football League as well. You know, mm-hmm. The problem is if you've got 90, the best part of 90 clubs, I think there's sometimes just that reality check needed that they can't all be successful and um, you get some owners come in, they, they see there is big money at the, the very successful pyramid <laughs> and um, they, they chase it sometimes and... Mm-hmm. Um, they chase it and just go over the the lines that you know normal business exercise would take. So um, it's it's something that is being looked at. It probably needs to have a tighter rank because some of the scale of the debt is, is is as worrying as you know just having debt in foot as well. And and it's really really tough in the current economic climate now for for a number of clubs to try and reduce that and and, and improve it. So um, it it is a concern. Um, you know we want players of football to, to benefit and be successful but it's got to work within the budget so I think um, in the next couple of years uh, there's a fair play uh, document coming out from UEFA as well I think it will be um, a little bit more rigid than, than perhaps it's been in the past and we won't get quite the the excessive problems that have occurred in the last five years. So Trevor, I want to thank you sincerely for making time. It is a true honour to speak with you. And um, I know many of our fans, like Sir David Scarf, who's a West Ham fanatic, has been looking forward to this interview for a long, long time. Trevor, thank you so much for everything. And I wish you personally all the best in English FA. Thank you yeah, so okay. much. Well, okay, a pleasure. And any West Ham fans that are listening, we've got a traumatic five weeks ahead to see if we survive in the Premier League this season. Yet again, it's always a roller coaster with the Hammers. Anyway, nice to speak to you and wish you well. In the so, Trevor, could you just say one thing before you go? Could you just, the young yeah. David Scarf is from London. His wife just had a baby. If you could just wish him all the best, I'd, I'd pass that on to him. He'd be delighted. Yeah, sure. Hi, this is Trevor Brookin, uh, David Scarver. I know he's a very, very keen West Ham fan who's just had a new arrival his family, into the family. So hopefully that's a potential West Ham fan <laughs> in the future. Uh, all the very best. And um, as I say, I hope everyone's well and uh, look forward to perhaps speaking to you in the future. Yeah, gentlemen, Trevor, thank you so much, buddy. Take care, mate. Okay, all the best. No problem. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.